Tonight, the dangers of vaping. Why did Canada ignore the warnings? And what's inside those products anyway? Wait till you see our lab tests. We tested some flavors that show high toxicity. CBC News investigates. The premiers present the prime minister a united front for now. This is a story of being trafficked. This is a story of abuse. A blockbuster interview. Prince Andrew's accuser tells her story. And with human trafficking on the rise, we're there for an early morning bust. How dangerous could it be? Uh, it could be very dangerous. Just how much of a difference can it really make? This is The National. When vaping devices like e-cigarettes first appeared, there was a lot of talk about how they could be used as tools to help stop a deadly habit. But just a decade later, we're seeing that they pose significant problems of their own. 50 years ago, about half of Canadians smoked. Now, just 15% do. Vaping, it was thought, could get those last holdouts off cigarettes. But what was missing? Solid evidence on the potential harm. So tonight on The National, we launch our special series on this new habit and its connection to big tobacco. Now, vaping devices are often nicotine delivery vehicles. But while tobacco products must list other chemicals inside, vaping products do not. So what are Canadians breathing in? Christine Birak took a look. To find out what's in e-cigarette or vape fluids, we hit shops around Toronto buying various pods, bottles and cartridges of vaping liquids. The next step is to get all of these tested. Health Canada doesn't require companies to put ingredient labels on vape products. The agency warns vaping produces an aerosol that may contain dozens of chemicals and lists just four. The highly addictive drug nicotine along with propylene glycol, glycerol and flavours. A lab at the Roswell Park Cancer Institute in New York tested the vape products we purchased. Technicians analyzed eight different brand name products. So these are the results of the nicotine concentration. In, in the Some nearly hit the maximum nicotine level allowed, but did match what was advertised. As for the flavors? We tested some flavors and that show high toxicity. Results showed numerous chemicals, including benzaldehyde used in cherry flavor. At high doses, it can cause breathing problems. Even more concerning, synthetic polygon, a chemical that simulates mint and menthol. This is uh, additive that has been banned in, in food products uh, in the U.S. So it's it was found to cause cancer in lab animals. Health Canada says it's planning to measure the concentration and potential health effects of polygon in vaping liquids. We asked this lung researcher what he knows about the safety of vape chemicals. Uh, next to nothing, right? And, and this is the main problem. So he adds there are thousands of flavoring chemicals. Some are safe to put in your stomach, but most have never been tested in other parts of the human body. Can it affect the immune system? Can it affect mucus clearance? Uh, can it actually kill cells in the lungs? So for all those flavors, we really don't know. The Canadian Vaping Association admits their products aren't safe for non-smokers. It's not benign. No one suggested that it was benign. What it is, is a lot less harmful than the 7,000 chemicals that you, inject, or that you inhale as you smoke. But for those who never smoked, vaping is a harmful new addiction. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Now, while scientists scramble to find out how vaping affects our health, more and more young people are doing it. So still ahead in our special series, Vape Fail. More on marketing a potentially risky habit to a vulnerable demographic. People just really thought it was really cool. And people were saying that, oh, it's just water. And that made you think that vaping was okay. This is a nightmare for everybody. We're not protecting kids. And we're not actually doing a good job getting the products in the hands of people who could benefit. We'll take a closer look at how a policy gray zone has given big tobacco a big leg up. That's coming up. This now infamous image of Prince Andrew and a teenage girl is the subject of yet another primetime interview tonight, her side of the story. Virginia Jufri recalls vivid details of an encounter the prince says never happened. And as Renee Filipponi tells us, she is asking the British public to stand beside her. But I knew I had to keep him happy because that's what Jeffrey and Gillen would ex expect from me. 
During the BBC Panorama interview, Virginia Jufri talks about the night this photo was taken. She was 17 and says she was flown to London by Jeffrey Epstein and his girlfriend, Glenn Maxwell, then forced to have sex with the prince. This is not some sordid sex story. This is a story of being trafficked. This is a story of abuse. And this is a story of your guys' your, your guys's royalty. I have absolutely no memory. The interview was done before Andrew's disastrous one-on-one. -on -one. I don't remember meeting her at all. In it, he was asked about Jufri and her accusations. He denied them all. The ongoing scandal has unveiled a potential turning point for the royal family. Prince Charles is reportedly stepping up his role in an attempt to get a handle on it. This is the time when she's going to lean on the people that she calls her substitutes. This royal are, watcher says rumors are swirling. The queen, following this scandal, may be looking to hand over the reins. The palace is denying that. And when she's ready to step back, scale down those duties and hand over to Charles, I think she will be the one to make that decision. Outside Buckingham Palace, opinion is mixed on how the royal family has dealt with this. They're not dealing with it. You know, it's, it's, I, I, have I changed my, my views? Yes. I mean, they're, they're gone down in my books. So. We have to wait. Cannot draw any conclusions before we have all, um, all facts. A lawyer for five of Epstein's victims has prepared subpoenas that could force Prince Andrew to testify as a witness. They claim he saw women and girls give massages at Epstein's home, but the prince has maintained he never saw anything suspicious. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will visit Buckingham Palace tomorrow and will meet with Prince Charles, too. Trudeau is in London tonight ahead of a two-day NATO summit, and tomorrow he also has a bilateral meeting with Donald Trump. The U.S. is pressuring Canada to spend more on defense and also to keep China's telecom giant Huawei away from the West's high-tech security grid. So Trudeau is grappling with, it seems, rosy demands from abroad and also clearly here on the home front. That's right, Adrian, because Canada's premiers today had a few things to say after a meeting behind closed doors. We've heard in recent weeks, of course, these ta this talk of regional divisions widening in the country. But today, all of the provincial and territorial leaders presented a united front. Here's David Cochran to tell us what they're after and how that might line up with Trudeau's own agenda. Oh my God! There you go. This was intended as an act of friendship. The folks of PEI will be proud. But while they're all premiers, they're not all Leafs fans. The last two games, the Habs won That's right. against exactly. the Maple Leafs. That's right. With that exception, there was a lot of common ground. The premiers agreeing to a short list of issues to force the prime minister to work on their terms. This was a tremendous moment of solidarity. They backed Alberta's key demand for changes to the little-known and little-used fiscal stabilization program, a program designed to help provinces deal with economic slumps. I've been trying to convey to Albertans that we are not alone or isolated in the Federation, uh, that there are provincial and, and territorial governments uh, who get what we're going through. The trick now is to get Ottawa on side, as this demand alone could be worth billions of dollars. As with the call for a boost to health care transfers and more flexibility in the way federal transfers are delivered, especially when it comes to infrastructure. The provinces have shown that we can unite and work together to, cr to come to consensus, if you will, on these critical issues. And I respectfully would ask that our Prime Minister and the federal government now work with the leaders at this table. What's missing here is a unified position on pharmacare, a top priority for Justin Trudeau, a mixed priority for the premiers. Anytime we get an opportunity to expand pharmacare into places like Newfoundland and Labrador, these are discussions that I want to have. Don't start with another program. Get that right. Start by getting that right. In Quebec, we already have a pharmacare program, so that's why I was happy that we all agreed to ask for an opting out clause to the failed government. So consensus on their priorities, but not on Ottawa's. The premiers sit down with the prime minister early in the new year. David Cochran, CBC News, Mississauga, Ontario.
So David mentioned that fiscal stabilization program as a way for the federal government to help oil producing provinces through tough times, for instance. But Jason Kenney has also been demanding a fairer deal for Alberta under federal equalization. That's a program that's better known, but not so easily understood. Here's Peter Armstrong with a primer. Calculating who gets what is complex. One report called it the black box of equalization arithmetic. First things first, this is a federal program. Ottawa collects tax revenues from across the country and uses that for any number of things, including transfers to the provinces. We often talk about equalization, but that is just one of three programs sending federal money to the provinces. Canada health transfers, Canada social transfers, and equalization. At the heart of equalization is what's known as fiscal capacity. That's the revenue each province could raise if they all used a standard tax rate. Provinces with stronger economies raise more revenue than provinces with lower incomes. The feds use equalization to bring those with a weaker fiscal capacity up to a national standard. The formula actually started quite simply. Equalization equals the national standard minus each province's fiscal capacity. It's grown more complex over the years. Now it looks more like this. It's eye glazing for sure, but the main point remains the same. To use federal funds to top up provinces below the national average. Critics say the have provinces, like Alberta, send money to the have-not provinces, like Quebec, to subsidize programs like cheap daycare. It's clear, it's simple, and it's wrong. Alberta doesn't send money to any province. Ottawa collects federal taxes at an equal rate across the country. It's not so much that Alberta pays more, high-income individuals do, and a lot of them happen to live in Alberta. Okay, so all provinces get some federal money. How much are we actually talking about here, Peter? Well, as you well know, Rosie, it changes every year. So let's get a look at the current formula for this fiscal year. Every province, including Alberta and Saskatchewan, get at least $1,400 about per person. This year, Ontario did not qualify for equalization, so it received that basic amount. As you see, the other remaining provinces, they're the ones that received the most. And that makes a certain amount of sense. I mean, those provinces have more elderly Canadians, for example, whose needs make them eligible, frankly, for more funding. Okay, that graphic helped me a lot. Hopefully it'll help everyone else too. Thanks, Peter. You Appreciate bet. it. We'll get a better sense of the Liberal government's plans a little bit later this week. On Thursday, the Governor General will read the speech from the throne. It will open a new session of Parliament and lay out the minority government's priorities. Expect, of course, mentions of climate change, pharmacare and reconciliation. But it may also set the tone for how Parliament might work and may even contain olive branches to opposition parties whose support will be needed. You can watch the speech from the throne this Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern on CBC Television, CBC NN online and GEM, I'll be there too. A major climate change conference is underway in Madrid, drawing thousands of delegates and government negotiators. The shorthand name is COP25, and climate activists call it a last chance effort to get policy right. Salima Shivji looks at one major piece of unfinished business and how it fits with Canadian politics. A top goal at this year's COP to get political agreement on the contentious issue of carbon credits and how low emission countries could trade their unused greenhouse gas to high emission countries. We will be working to see if we can come to some consensus on that, but at the end of the day, Canada needs to, to, do, uh, to do its part to address its own domestic emissions. That concept of trading carbon credits has champions here. Of Article 6 of the Paris Treaty. And they've been getting louder. Alberta's Jason Kenney talks up Article 6 as the single biggest action Canada can take to fight climate. He thinks the country can get credits for exporting liquefied natural gas because it's a cleaner option than coal. And he has allies. Through Article 6 of the Paris Accord, we have an opportunity to make an impact far beyond the borders of this nation. The global game changer on greenhouse gas emissions that Canada can play in the foreseeable future is significantly increasing our LNG exports, and I think we're pretty much united on that. But some experts say the premiers are missing the point. It's not about helping us to export our fossil fuels for profit. But international climate negotiations do not revolve around Canadian politics. And unfortunately, I think this kind of rhetoric really muddies the waters.
Ottawa may be in agreement with the premiers, hoping to trade credits one day. But even then, Canada would have to find countries one by one that would want to buy the cleaner gas and then share the credits they earn for reducing emissions. For now, there's some consensus here, not so much at this table. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Shaping up to be a busy week here in Ottawa. For now, though, back to Andrew and Adrian in Toronto. We do have an update to a story we brought you last night. The person killed in a highway pileup in Ontario has been identified as 33-year-old Matthew Jameson of Nova Scotia. Our charge is applicable? We don't know yet, so that's still under investigation. Police say at least 30 to 40 vehicles were involved in the crash. It happened yesterday afternoon and shut down a portion of Highway 401 near Kingston for about 14 hours. There's no word yet on the cause, but the area was under a travel advisory due to heavy snowfall. Now in Toronto this morning, weather was only partly to blame for commuter chaos. The other culprit, a fire on a subway track at the height of rush hour. Thousands scrambled to get to work and school. And as Ali Shiasong explains, officials are pointing to an aging infrastructure. This is what the underneath of the subway looks like. I actually saw the flash go off and it was, you could almost hear an electrical, almost like a welder and all the fans and engines turned off. These two college students were complete strangers this morning until a fire underground forced commuters to lean on each other. We were there for maybe 40 minutes, 40 minutes. And yeah. the smoke started to get like increasingly bad, like people were starting to cough, like people were offering each other water, like... Um, is this in the car? This is still in the car, yeah, yeah. Eventually, they had to make their way out through the dark tunnel. They also had like the fire department, like we're just like moving alongside with their flashlights trying to help. Him and I, like he was directing a blind woman. It was just like out of a movie. Everyone got out okay. The worst of it, the odd scratchy throat. I often have like heaviness in my lungs from all that smoke, yeah. but yeah, it was it was interesting. Yeah. Quite the morning. Close the doors. Where you go? It wasn't much easier for commuters above ground. I've been over two hours waiting, over two hours, and the shuttle buses have been a disaster. Absolutely terrible. It's cold, and it's just a lot right now. Morning like this morning is frustrating for people. We absolutely get that. Uh, you know, the, it's 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 the worst time of day for these things to happen. The TTC thinks that a wooden segment along the east-west line 2 caught fire from a spark. These sections of line 2 that are the original are now 50 plus years old. 75% of line 2 has these wooden cover boards. The section that caught fire this morning was repaired temporarily, but TTC crews will be back down there overnight to do a more fulsome fix and conduct an investigation into the cause. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. We're back in two minutes with more news, including an exclusive look inside a delicate and dangerous police operation. The target's there, so can you make your way to the front door? The National is there as investigators move in on human trafficking suspects. Rare access right after the break. And later, Donald Trump leaves for the NATO summit, but cannot leave behind the threat of impeachment. And we're watching several stories across Canada tonight, including a school bus crash in Alberta. Several students rushed to hospital. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back. Human trafficking is the fastest growing crime in Canada. The victims, often underage girls, lured into the sex trade. And fighting it is a priority for police. Joanna Rumiliotis joined officers from Ontario's Durham region in the small hours of this morning as they sprang into action. It's the middle of the night and it starts with a briefing. There's information about firearms at both places. Durham police officers have arrest warrants and a plan. So everybody's clear on what we're doing? Minutes later, the human trafficking unit is on the move. At what point you decided it's time to move in? Um, I think when we have enough evidence that we've gathered from uh, the victim's statement and, uh, and then just the right timing and safety concerns. This investigation started months ago when a 15-year-old girl came forward to Durham Victim Services. She said she had been lured on social media and forced into the sex trade. We're going to protect our victim, number one, and then lay charges 
and hopefully prevent them from trafficking any other uh, other females that are out there. Either way, we still support them. The focus here is on supporting victims, even if they don't file a formal complaint. The numbers are skyrocketing. Many victims are underaged and terrified. If somebody says it doesn't bother them, they're lying to you. Well, a lot of us have daughters in the unit too, right? Yeah. So you can imagine that, you know, pitching your daughter and gravitating to, you know, this sickening trade that they're involved in, right? Where they're manipulated and they're forced into sex trafficking, where some of them are assaulted. They're brutalized for 10 to 15 times a day. You tackle, you don't need it. An hour later, they meet with a tactical unit at a Toronto police station. The evidence gathered so far points to two females working for a pimp who is in jail. The women may be former trafficking victims who became recruiters. Our suspects in the house there. So Hello. We're going to go up and take over from the tag team. Hey, yeah, the target's there, so can you make your way to the front door? Turns out only one of the two suspects was home. The human trafficking unit spends an hour gathering evidence before leading her out. There are likely more victims. The hope is they will now come forward too. On nights like this, do you feel like you've made a difference in the yes. fight? Yes, we have. What kind of difference do you think you're making? Uh, it's a little, uh, it's like taking a spoonful of water out of uh, Lake Ontario one bit at a time, but uh, we're trying our best and, and that's all we can do. And a tense night quietly ends. Joanna Brumaliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, let's go to our national newsroom in Vancouver where Ian is watching stories from across Canada. And Andrew, let's begin in Alberta where a crash involving a school bus has sent eight people to hospital, including five children in critical condition. Officials say 14 students were on that bus when it collided with a truck-mounted crane near Smoky Lake. That's northeast of Edmonton. A witness said the crash scene was terrifying with children's screams coming from the wreckage. Those students range from kindergarten to grade 12. Three of the injured were airlifted, the others moved by ground ambulance. An investigation into the cause of the crash is underway. Montreal police investigating an apparent case of road rage with a driver shot on a busy highway. There was a dispute between two drivers in northeast Montreal. Police say one drove his car alongside the other's moving vehicle, then fired his gun at the other driver. A 23-year-old man is being treated in hospital for injuries. They're described as not life-threatening. The suspect fled the scene and police are looking for any witnesses or video of the altercation. Another NHL coach under scrutiny tonight following allegations of physical abuse behind the bench. Mark Crawford has been placed on leave as assistant coach of the Chicago Blackhawks after recent allegations about his conduct during his time with the LA Kings. In a weekend interview with the New York Post, former NHL player Sean Avery said Crawford kicked him and left a mark. But then today, Avery added these comments via Twitter. Mark Crawford had every right in the world to kick me in the ass. I deserved it. I loved Crow. The Blackhawks say they'll be conducting a thorough review of the allegations. Crawford won't be with the team during the investigation. And one more hockey-related note for you tonight, and it involves an Ottawa senator. Mark Bovietsky is well known for his toughness on the ice. Well, he showed some of that off the ice right here in Vancouver. Police thank Bovietsky for knocking down a car thief and recovering the stolen goods. The victims of the London Bridge stabbings were honored tonight. That's one of our international stories I'll have for you in 10 minutes. All right, in time for a quick break. Up next on The National, a key week in the Trump impeachment hearings just as the U.S. president leaves the country. And later, how a generation of non-smokers is getting hooked on nicotine. The answer in our special look at vaping coming up. At the start of a pivotal week in Washington, lawmakers are poring over the House impeachment reports tonight before they're made public tomorrow. While Republicans want to make sure their narrative gets some airtime too. They released a full-throated defense of the president today, insisting Donald Trump did nothing wrong in his dealings with Ukraine. As Paul Hunter tells us, the president's supporters have another bone to pick, too. Bad timing. As Donald Trump left for his three-day trip to the NATO summit in London, consider it a parting shot 
of a kind. The Democrats, the radical left Democrats, the do-nothing Democrats. Slamming those leading the impeachment process against him, not least because it continues this week while he's away. This was set up a year ago, that when I'm going to NATO, that was the exact time. This is one of the most important journeys that we make as president. And for them to be doing this and saying this and putting an impeachment on the table, which is a hoax to start off with. Then again, Trump lawyers made clear yesterday they had no intention of taking part in what will happen while he's gone. Trump or no Trump, it's another key week. Tonight, lawmakers are readying for a vote to send it all to the next stage and a hearing Wednesday on what constitutes an impeachable offense. Then, likely next week, an examination of the evidence. And after that, a decision whether to officially lay charges. Nobody push it. The broad allegation for those who've somehow missed it is that Trump wrongly tried to pressure Ukrainian President Zelensky into digging up dirt on Trump rival Joe Biden. An abuse of power, say Democrats, for Trump's personal political gain. Says the White House, Trump's done nothing wrong. And as for the proceedings against him... This is an unconstitutional, illegitimate process, and we stand by that. To that, say Democrats who've heard testimony from multiple witnesses. This White House has blocked us every step of the way and then wants to cry that the process is, is unfair. Trump himself may yet choose to take part, to call for witnesses or even to testify. A decision on that is due by Friday. Regardless, the broad expectation remains that sometime this month he will be impeached. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. And we'll be right back with a special CBC News project. Vaping was supposed to help people quit smoking. So how exactly have so many younger people become so addicted? And did Canada ignore the warning signs? And later, in tonight's moment, he thought he was saving a dog. Little did he know what he actually welcomed into his vehicle. Back just after a short break. Welcome back to our national newsroom in Vancouver. Former U.S. President Jimmy Carter is back in hospital tonight. He's being treated for a urinary tract infection. The 95-year-old was admitted over the weekend, and according to the Carter Center, he's already feeling better. Last month, he was admitted to a hospital because of pressure on his brain from recent falls. He was released less than a week ago. Carter is the oldest living former U.S. president in history. Vigils were held today for the two people killed in last week's stabbing attack near London Bridge. The British Prime Minister joining other politicians for a moment of silence. And in Cambridge, where Jack Merritt and Saskia Jones went to university, scores of others crowded into Market Square to remember the two. Merritt and Jones were stabbed Friday after attending the same prisoner rehabilitation conference as their attacker, who had a previous conviction for a terror offence. At least five people are dead in southern France following a second round of heavy flooding. Three of the dead were emergency workers whose helicopter crashed during a rescue mission. Two other people were swept away by rising floodwaters. The region has been hit hard by torrential rains over the past week, submerging streets, inundating homes and shops, and causing widespread disruption. And winds and rain from a powerful typhoon are lashing parts of the Philippines where the Southeast Asia Games are underway. Thousands of residents forced to evacuate, but officials for the game say they have contingency plans in place and they'll be making adjustments to the competition schedule. That's it for now from Vancouver. Back to Adrian and Andrew in Toronto. And now let's turn back to our special series on vaping in Canada. It is poorly understood, potentially dangerous, popular, especially with younger people, just like smoking once was. Young Canadians have been turning away from cigarettes. Five years ago, about 20% said they smoked occasionally. Now that's down to less than 16%. But walk by a high school, or anywhere, really, and you will not have a hard time finding young people who vape. Maybe that's not surprising, considering an entire industry now markets directly to them. And there's a reason why they're so good at it. 
Remember, many of these vaping companies are now owned by tobacco giants, which have decades of experience selling a product in the face of adversity. Christine Birak looks at how they do it. A new generation is hooked on an old drug. And make no mistake, nicotine can damage a developing brain. At Richview Collegiate in Toronto, grade 9 students are just learning about the dangers of vaping. So learning goals for today's class, why e-cigarettes and vape pens are so popular with youth lately. Question 2. So e-cigarettes are devices that produce nicotine and are addictive in the form of a vapor, steam, aerosol. New numbers reveal alarming increases among vaping in youth. We just want to ask a couple of questions. Uh, I think it would be more comfortable for you if you did this with your eyes closed or your heads on your desk if you'd like. Um, so first question is, how many people know someone who vapes? Okay. 25 to 30 percent of Canadian high school students admit to vaping nicotine in the past month. People just really thought it was really cool. and People were saying that, oh, it's just water. And that made you think that vaping was okay and that it was like nothing really. Other answers are great. We knew those were correct as well, but yes, all of the above can be. Educators like Janine Davies are trying to undo those messages, explaining the dangers of inhaling yeah, so like heated chemicals and how they were lured into it to begin with. I really wanted them to see that what the big tobacco companies did was they, they found a new product and they found a new way to market something towards teens because cigarettes weren't, weren't working anymore. I'm Jenny McCarthy and I finally found a smarter alternative to cigarettes. Enticing kids with sweet flavors, cool tricks, celebrities and clever marketing on social media. The more they learn, the more some feel abandoned by governments and duped by big tobacco, now big vape in its new form. Obviously they should care, but I don't think they really care because they just want the money. When you endorse it and you make it popular, people really want to try that and be like, okay, so vaping is actually normal. Normal and cool, just like cigarettes in the 1950s. And you'll feel better about smoking with a taste of Kent. Kind tasting to your throat, kind tasting to your taste buds. But what happened to the lessons learned from smoking? How could yet another highly addictive, untested, and potentially deadly product end up on store shelves right next to candy? We call them heated tobacco sticks. They're David tobacco Hammond is a public health professor at the University of Waterloo. To advertise the irony is we got here through an attempt to help adult smokers. We still have five million adult smokers. One out of every two or three are likely to die unless they quit. In 2009, Health Canada was advising Canadians not to use e-cigarettes or vaping devices, stating there could be health risks. The devices were not authorized as smoking cessation aids and according to Health Canada, hazardous to the health of children. But a vocal group of public health experts, including Hammond, supported the potential benefits of vaping. I remember testifying to, to one of the federal committees and saying, smokers should have access to these. We need to be honest with smokers that they're not going to be as harmful as smoking. It's been marketed as safe and it's, it's really misled them. Experts, including Dr. Richard Stanwick, argued right back, insisting Big Vape hadn't even proven the safety or effectiveness of their products. Absolutely no evidence to suggest that these were going to be uh, helpful in getting people uh, off of cigarettes. In 2015, Stanwick wrote a paper warning vaping or e-cigarettes could end up renormalizing public smoking, reversing five decades of tobacco control and revitalizing nicotine dependency in children. But his side was losing the public health debate. We're just seen as Luddites, that these are nervous Nellies, that um, they have found the solution. It's almost evangelical in this movement that the, the vape industry is, is the one that's going to solve the, the cigarette problem. And we're here to uh, talk about the Bill S-5, an act to amend the Tobacco Act. Just last year, Health Canada made it official. This bill is a key element of the government's broader tobacco control agenda. Putting basic restrictions on the manufacturing, sale, labeling and promotion of vape products. Nothing near the strict rules slapped on cigarettes. 
At the same time, high-dose nicotine products like Juul were entering the market and already appealing to children. Suddenly, both sides of the public health debate agreed. Health Canada's regulations were far too weak. This is a nightmare for everybody. So we're failing both target markets. We're not protecting kids, and we're not actually doing a good job getting the products in the hands of people who could benefit, which is adult smokers, to quit. What does the future market hold? It can't look like it is today. Governments will need to take meaningful action so that we're still not talking about this problem and scratching our heads about what to do two, three, four, five years from now. Unlike health regulators in the United States who've declared a youth vaping epidemic, Health Canada has said relatively little about the rising number of children using nicotine, nor would it agree to an interview to talk about the crisis in kids, its failed attempt to help smokers quit, or what it plans to do next. Back at Richview, Janine Davies is teaching her students how to be media savvy in the new world of vaping. On the left, we've got an old classic cigarette ad. On the right, we've got a new ad for a vaping product. So can you see the similarities between the two of them? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's like it's good for you. Yeah. And like for us. Well, and like the way they yeah. portray it, it makes it seem like if you smoke, it'll be more desirable. Yeah. These are teenage girls. Experts say the number of children vaping in this country hasn't plateaued yet. Milo is the hassle-free nicotine pouch. And for the first time in decades, Big Tobacco has a growing market and a range of new nicotine delivery products are coming. No limits. As young Canadians quietly breathe new life into a dangerous old habit. And we have Christine joining us now along with CBC's medical sciences correspondent Kelly Crow, and of course her story Vape Fail now available at CBC. Uh, news.ca. So, Christine, let's start with you, though, because, I mean, in your piece, we see more and more young people vaping, and yet these devices are illegal for kids. So, big question, where are they getting them from? I had the exact same question, and after that health class was over, I asked a group of grade 9 girls if they'd stay behind and try to answer some of these questions for me, because I honestly thought they were buying them online, and the girls said, well, we don't have credit cards. Mm. They said that some kids will buy prepaid credit cards in grocery stores, which are meant to be gift cards, but that's not how the bulk of them are getting them. They're actually picking them up at home. So mom or dad or an older sibling has tried vaping. Maybe they tried a flavor and they don't like it. And then they leave them just lying around and they just get picked up right from the counters, right from the shelves. And also the other way that they're getting them, and it's the same way that kids got cigarettes and they got booze, is there's always a trusted adult involved and they go and buy them for them. But it is so easy for them to get their hands on them. The girl said to me, if you want, we'll take you out to the schoolyard right now. We can go buy some cartridges if you want. Interesting. Um, and speaking of adults, though, I mean, Kelly, when you look at when e-cigarettes first hit the market, I mean, there was this suggestion out there that, hey, this could be a, a really useful tool in helping adults quit smoking. How much scientific evidence was there to, to back that up, that that would happen? Well, it, actually, it wasn't just a suggestion. The entire uh, federal policy is based on this, what is essentially an unproven hypothesis that this would work to, to help uh, smokers quit. In fact, as the policy was being developed, there was not enough or really any evidence. And as it stands right now, this, the studies that are coming in are suggesting that these are uh, 85 to 95 percent ineffective. Hmm. So people are, smokers are starting vaping but many of them are just keeping continuing to smoke right so now we have dual users so so Christine the, I mean the experts that you've spoken to what do they say needs to happen next I would say the top three that I've heard in terms of changes would be to get rid of all the ads hmm. limit the number of flavors because that's what's drawing the kids in young people yeah exactly and also to lower the nicotine levels right now in Canada the limit is 60 milligrams per milliliter and that is three times what the li limit is in Europe the, this whole policy was designed to create as much access as possible with a nod to trying to, uh, possibly more than a nod, with, a, with an intention of restricting uh, access to kids. Now that we've seen that this hasn't prevented youth uptake, the po people are calling for a restriction in provinces and municipalities across the country are working on ways to narrow access to these devices. Kelly, Christine, thanks very much. You're welcome. Thank you. And our special series on vaping continues tomorrow with a look at how the habit can affect your teeth. Spoiler alert, it's not pretty.
you can see significant recession where the gum tissue is being destroyed or killed by the chemicals in the vaping solution. And so potentially bad for your mouth. And new research shows it doesn't take long to do a lot of damage. That's tomorrow on The National. Plus, as part of our series, we're hosting an expert discussion, and we want to answer your questions. So email them to us at thenational at cbc.ca. That conversation will air this Wednesday night here on The National. And you can also join our special live Facebook Q&A this Wednesday afternoon, 2 p.m. Eastern. All right, so time for a quick break. We will be right back with more news on The National, including a look at why more and more people are using food banks, and a lot of them have jobs but are still struggling. That's next. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud in for Jamie Poisson. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, the Premier's meeting and how provincial and territorial leaders are flexing their priorities in the face of the Prime Minister's agenda. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. This is the season of giving, and according to a new report, the number of people in need is staggering. The nonprofit Feed Ontario says more than half a million people visited food banks across the province over the past year. And as Ellen Morrow explains, many of them have jobs. There we go. For Beryl and Mark, both her greatest joy and biggest stress comes from providing for her kids. And you don't know where the extra dollar is going to come from to buy food for your children. And so the single mother of five actively looking for a job relies on her local food bank. Canada is one of the wealthy, most wealthiest country in the world. And it's, it's disheartening to see that so many people has to line up sometimes in a cold, freezing cold, to get uh, something basic or necessary as food. Would you like hummus? The new report says food bank use across Ontario is on the rise. Even the number of employed people using food banks has jumped 27% over the past three years. The report attributes the rise in users to an increase in temporary jobs and low wages. It also found that one in 10 Ontarians doesn't make enough money to afford a basic standard of living. People are working multiple part-time positions or multiple contract jobs to make ends meet. So it's becoming increasingly difficult to acquire sufficient income to make, meet all their needs at the end of the month. According to the report, children and single-person households rely on food banks the most. Volunteer Marilyn Minnick-Lamarche says she's noticed the growing numbers. You see younger people, you see young families, you see people on their own, you see seniors. So it's really a very diverse group of people accessing the food bank. Beryl Ann Mark fears it may only get worse. Every year some people have their rent increase um, and, uh, you know, the food prices has gone up, clothing prices, so everything has gone up. And so do her worries, especially before the holidays. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. And we'll be right back with tonight's moment. A case of mistaken identity after a collision with an animal on the road. Now, don't worry, it all ends well. We'll tell you all about it after the break. Well, this is what happened to a Good Samaritan's car after hitting a big dog on his way to work. It was stunned from the crash, so the man worrying for its safety hoisted it into the back seat of his car. Except that big dog was not actually a dog. It was a coyote, who, uh, by the way, is now recovering nicely. But that not-so-brief moment of mistaken identity is our moment tonight. The first person I brought out to see him, you know, because I told him, I was, you know, I hit a, I hit a dog, and he, so he said, okay, let's go see, and comes out and he says, that's not a dog. <laughs> okay. Her head, I guess, hit right there. The amount of time the whole thing happened was like less than 20 seconds, probably, from the time that I saw her start across the road till I hit her. Working on the premise that I had that it was a dog, I was worried that in that condition, because it was sort of out to lunch, uh, that if a praying animal came by, it would kill it, which is why I decided to take her. She was docile, very docile, 
Her eyes were open, moved her head a little bit, but that's it. No, no growling, no barking. I reached behind, I was petting her, and she was not purring or anything, but not being vicious, just taking it. Okay, so this is a very nice man <laughs> yeah. uh, to reach behind and to pet this poor dog, not dog. Uh, and I, I can't help but think somewhere out there there's a horror movie screenwriter <laughs> saying, oh, this could have ended very, very badly. The dog, the, you see, you have me doing it now. The coyote is actually okay. No broken bones. Yeah, which is good news. And, and originally I was thinking, well, there's not even really a cautionary tale here because, you know, it's not a do not pick up wildlife thing because he thought it was a dog. Except maybe the cautionary tale is just Google what a coyote looks like. <laughs> also a cautionary tale, don't go for a drive with this guy through the Serengeti, because no <laughs> telling what he might pick up after accidentally hitting it. And one other, talking about Google, I was trying to find the definitive Canadian pronunciation for the word coyote oh, or boy. coyote. Uh, there is a debate raging on Twitter as we speak, and uh, no clear de definitive answer. Hmm. Coyote, I go for <laughs> coyote. That is The National for December the 2nd. Good night. Good night. Good night.